Hi hey everyone, uh, welcome to this Search Engine Journal Marketing Think Tank webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got a great one for you today. My name is Danny Goodwin. I'm the executive editor of Search Engine Journal and I will be your moderator. Uh, today you'll hear from Julia McCoy. Uh, she's the CEO of Express Writers. She is also uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, contributors to read on Search Engine Journal. Uh, she's been writing for us since 2014, and I just looked through and saw that she's hit about 100 articles for us over the years, so very impressive work. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, if anyone watching uh, is involved in content creation, optimization, or promotion, make sure you check out Julia's posts every month on Search Engine Journal. Uh, and today, uh, Julia's going to be talking about the do nots of SEO, seven terrible no good SEO tactics to abandon forever. Uh, because let's face it, a lot of uh, outdated tactics, things that just don't work, but maybe did 10 or more years ago are still happening in 2019, and it's time to cut it out, guys. So uh, today, Julia will tell you what to do instead so you can stop wasting your time and effort on things that uh, won't pay off in the long term. So Julia, it's great to have you here. Uh, do you want to tell a little bit about yourself and uh, how people can follow you online? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Danny, for that warm welcome. Yeah, so you can find me on almost any platform at Julia E. McCoy. That's my uh, my YouTube username. Doesn't have the E, so that's the only difference. And on Instagram, I'm Fem Entrepreneur. So, like Danny said, I've been writing for Search Engine Journal for a long time. It's one of my go-to publications, especially as a columnist. So, what I do day to day, I'm the CEO of Express Writers. I've written two books, and I love to educate in the content marketing sphere. So what I know best is SEO friendly content marketing, content marketing that's powered through great SEO content. And since 2011, my agency at Express Writers of over 90 writers by now, we've created content for all kinds of clients around the globe. I think we just hit the 16,500 project mark last month. So with that said, welcome to today's webinar, the do nots of SEO, or as Danny was saying already, the seven terrible no good tactics to forever abandon this year and beyond. So before we begin, I have a question for you. Why should we care about what not to do when it comes to our website and Google friendly practices? Well, here's why. Google is really pro user. And if we're pr still practicing outdated or even worse, penalization worthy practices, Google and our human audience is going to feel a little upset when they hit our site. <laughs> and I took some inspiration from Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. It goes in line with today's topic. So whenever we think of our users and Google interacting with our site and finding these anti-user situations, Think of Steve Carroll's face. His expression really sums up the feelings that Google and our reader have when they find us guilty of these pra bad practices. And as we're going to go over, this can be subconsciously or not. These can be practices that you're not even aware you're doing. Many website owners, especially the ones we work with in our content agency, they've come to us to say, what are bad practices? So a lot of times, you know, it's not even your fault if you weren't aware of what these were. So as we already mentioned, Google is really pro user and their webmaster guidelines, their search quality standards really talk a, about a lot of things, a lot of standards that are good for users. So this isn't just good for SEO rankings. This is all the way down to your user, the person on your website. So for example, here we have an example of doorway pages from Google's webmaster guidelines. And Google says, in the second sentence that these pages are bad for users and these are thin, very low content pages that are just created for specific search queries. So they're not really created to add value to users' lives. And that's what Google cares about. So this is why we care about avoiding bad practices for search. 
this is in a world of 3.2 billion people. So almost half the entire population is using the internet. And what's more, if you add together the traffic from all popular search engines, being Yahoo, Google, YouTube, 70.6% of all online traffic originates from a search engine. And guess what, 60% of that is from Google. So this is why we care about Google standards. And this is research that was based on Spark Toro, Rand Fishkin's new company, and one other publisher. So as you can see, Google, look at the left there. Google is number one in all of that traffic online. 60% is coming from Google. So that's really crazy when we think about, you know, how 3.2 billion people are online and 60% of traffic is coming from Google. So some real talk here, you know, to ignore how our website is performing in search is just plain irresponsible. We have to care about Google these days. There are so many people using that search engine to find us and our content and what we share. So the good news is that if you put the right practices in place, you are going to have a success story and consistent great content really pays off. So. I create a ton of content. I can't do it without my team at Express Writers. So it's all of us creating it together. Content is what I love. So I don't mind going in a hermit hole in my office just creating. So for the past eight years, 99% of all of our leads and revenue have actually come through our SEO content. So on the left at the top, that's the back end of our site. We have over 1,100 published blogs. And the left on the bottom, that is a screenshot from SEMrush. So we're seeing 31,000 traffic number. That's the quantity of people visiting our site from over 20,000 keywords. And if we were to pay for this traffic in Google AdWords, it would look like a lot of money per month, almost $90,000. So month to month, we have almost 100,000 visitors every single month on Express Writers from these organic inbound rankings. So we fluctuate anywhere from 80 to 90 to 100K visitors per month. And this is no paid ads running on our content. This is sourced through inbound traffic. We have a few other sources, so this is about 99% of our leads come through our content. The other 1% come through referrals, you know, that type of thing. But for eight years, we've been able to achieve 100% of our business revenue through content. So SEO practices and good content works. Okay, so with that, let's head into a poll question. And I think at this point, I should hand it over to Danny. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay, so it's time for our first poll question. So what is your biggest concern when it comes to your SEO efforts? So uh, you want to pick one of these four uh, answers here. So you've got tracking real success metrics, figuring out how to create high-ranking SEO content, getting love from the algorithm and learning what Google likes or something else. So uh, while you all vote, um, I'm going to do a few housekeeping notes. Um, just so everyone's aware. Um, so if, and, and during the uh, course of the webinar, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask through our uh, question box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Julia will try to answer as many questions as possible uh, after she's done with her presentation. Um, and also, I just wanted to make you aware that there's also a, um, a handout that Julia has created for all of you. So. Um, and I think this is actually the first time we've tried this. So uh, it's basically a cheat sheet that covers a lot of the things that Julie is talking about today. Um, you just want to download that. So to do that, simply find the handouts panel uh, that's in the go to content panel. Just click on that and it will start downloading for you. Um, and of course, just to remind everyone that this entire webinar will be recorded and made available, and we'll have that all in a recap post on Search Engine Journal, uh, including the slides. Uh, that should be up by Monday. So let's see, what were our results? Um, so 50% said figuring out uh, how to create high-ranking SEO content. That was the biggest challenge. Uh, the second biggest challenge, 26% said tracking real success metrics, and 22% said getting love from the algorithm. So there are your poll results, uh, Julia. So I'll hand it back over to you. Very cool. Awesome. I love getting some real-time 
answers from our audience. That is great. So let's get into our seven SEO no-nos. And let's start with the first one. So the first bad tactic that we're going to cover is using your target keyword in an outdated, forced, and stuffy style. So in old SEO days, which really isn't that old, <laughs> probably this was around in 2011, 2010, so not super old, but I like to call it the old SEO days because today is so different from 2011. Back then, it was really common to see one keyword targeted per page. So on the right, that's how people used to create content. But now with semantic SEO, it's better to create topical content. So one comprehensive in-depth page that addresses the topic and then uses all of the synonymous keywords. So today, if we were to separate related keywords like this into multiple pieces of content, we would be ignoring the importance of semantic search, which looks at the topic of a page rather than the repeated instances of keywords to determine that relevancy to our search engine user intent. So another reason to avoid doing this is something called keyword cannibalization. AREFS actually defines this as when a single website unintentionally targets the same keyword across multiple posts or pages. So going back to keyword cannibalization, what this does is it can cause an undesirable page that you really don't want to rank in the top of Google to rank above something you created that is amazing, that you wanted to rank in the top for Google. So avoid creating too much content around similar keywords. Bucket those keywords and create a piece that's more semantic search friendly. So the solution, as we already mentioned, is to focus on staying topically relevant in our content. And we're gonna use the focus keyword as a jumping off point. So if you want to include some relevant keywords throughout your content piece, you can go to Google, type in your focus keyword and look at the bottom of the page. And you'll actually be able to see related keywords for your topic keyword at the bottom in Google. And what I do is I grab all of these, I put them in an Excel, and I give them to my writer whenever we're creating a comprehensive piece. So these are real-time keywords that people are actually using in Google that you can scrape, use, and create amazing guides with that are semantic search friendly. Okay, so yeah, as we already mentioned, all of those synonymous keywords are excellent keyword choices to use in our blog. Okay, so back to our second poll question, and I'll hand it over to Danny at this moment. Okay, so our second poll question, how often do you perform keyword research? So uh, are you doing keyword research once a day, once a week, once a month, or do you never do any keyword research? And I'm hoping with our audience, it definitely isn't never, but um, we may be surprised to find out the results in a minute. Um, yeah, so I don't know, how often do you perform keyword research, Julia? I'm just curious. Oh gosh, well I am a total SEO content nerd, as all of you can probably tell, so I'm doing it once every three days now, just mm. in like Keyword Finder or SEMrush, looking up keyword data, and the data changes so often, you know, what was once a good keyword is now no longer, just a few weeks down the line. Yep. That's so true. Oh, and the results are in. Okay, so 50% of our attendees say that they are doing keyword research once a month. Um, and 30% are doing it once a week, and 17% once a day. So very wow. interesting results there. Yeah. That's impressive. It I is. like 17%. I feel you guys. I'm right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take it back over, Julia. Awesome. Okay, so heading into our second bad SEO no-no, this is all about short, thin, or non-comprehensive content. So this kind of ties into the first one. We talked about those related keywords using Google to identify those. So shorter, yeah, shorter pieces have their place, but really not so much in SEO. There's been several studies that have been done on this 
by top leading sources. BuzzSumo did one. They analyzed more than 100 million articles. And Backlinko did one as well. They studied over a million blog posts. So the most shared, and this is interesting, the most shared and the highest ranked content is actually long form, anywhere from 1,900 to 3,000 words. So it's interesting to find out that long form content not only goes hand in hand with top ranked in Google, but it goes hand in hand with top shared. That was actually surprising to me when I dove into this study. So this was Basumo's study across different word counts and the majority of those long form pieces were shared on Facebook, interestingly enough. And then Backlinko's study of the top shared content, anywhere from 1,900 to 2,000 words was in the top of Google. And it was a little lower, the top one spot, so 1,900 to 2,000. So going back to how do we create long content? How do we solve a problem of just focusing on pieces that might be short, thin, and not comprehensive enough? Our solution is to create long form content. So think about writing posts that are a deep dive into your chosen topic and keyword. And that's where you can, going back to our how to make a latte example, you can put that into Google and then see what's related and you'll get so many synonymous keywords that make for great subheaders, subsections of content. So it's really not hard to create long form content once you have your keyword research down, you know what keywords to create and this webinar isn't about that. There's a lot of resources you can look into to create, to research the right keywords and know what you're looking for. But once you have the right keywords down, it's super easy to create long form content around those keywords, especially if you have long tail keywords instead of those shorter two phrase keywords. Okay, so moving on to our third bag tactic to avoid in SEO. So this is a really good one because once you get it right, <laughs> great things happen. So the SEO no-no here is all about posting content erratically instead of on schedule. So if you post content consistently, you're going to give Google fresh content. You're going to give your website more opportunities to rank with more index pages, more index keywords, and you'll build your authority steadily with users that visit your site. So again, some proof, some study, some fact-based studies here. HubSpot looked at blogging frequency data from more than 13,500 marketers and agencies. And they found that those who blogged regularly and consistently, 16 plus, so 16 or more times per month, they earned the most traffic and the most leads. So they compared this against people who blogged zero to four times a month. And they found that consistent bloggers earn 3.5 times more traffic, and here's the best part, 4.5 times more leads. So that is proof that consistency works when it comes to SEO content. And if you're just posting a piece here and there, when you can get to it, you're really not getting true SEO results. So set a blogging schedule, stick to it. Post consistent content, post regularly to build up the content library that's on your site. And don't be afraid to delegate. I delegate a lot of my content with my writers at Express Writers. So delegation is the answer if you're getting a little bit of burnout with consistency. So our, okay, so I'm so sorry. I thought this was the next point, but one thing we wanna mention here. Okay, so this does tie into the fourth tactic. So one thing we want to mention about quantity and quality with consistency, that can sometimes border quantity and you never want to focus on quantity over quality. So when it comes to SEO content, the content that gets rewarded in search engine rankings and with your users is quality content. So Google really cares about this, especially in the last two years consistently and going forward. This is also one of their huge metrics. So poorly written, crappy, low quality content does not contribute to those high rankings in Google. And Google actually has this massive document where they outline all of the standards they look for. And it's called the Google Quality Rater Guidelines. And Google talks about how pages need to achieve that intended purpose. So if you're writing on a topic, 
you need to address that topic fully and make that an in-depth piece. Give your users something to land on that will answer all of their questions. And then you want something that also demonstrates this acronym that Google talks about, EAT, or expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And if you're not familiar with these guidelines, I did write a blog a few years ago on an article on Search Engine Journal that is still relevant today. So definitely go check that out. The link is right up there at the top. <clears throat> And if you need that link, I'm sure we can give that to you in the comments as well through chat. Okay, so when it comes to creating quality content, here's my rule of thumb. I look at the top of content that's in the top five results on page one of Google for my keyword, and I focus on creating content that's better than those top five results. And if I can't, oftentimes I'll just toss out that keyword and go after a new one entirely. So if there's content out there that's the best and you really can't do better, that's where maybe it's time to go after another keyword. So definitely look for that balance where you can create and publish the highest quality content on a consistent basis. And if you're ever feeling a drop in quality, that's where you have to focus more on quality over quantity. Toss quantity out the window and focus on creating the best content that you can produce. So our fifth bad tactic to avoid is publishing duplicate content. And this may sound like a pretty obvious one, but I wanted to include it because of this. An SEMrush study of over 100,000 websites found out that one of the most common on-page SEO errors is actually duplicate content. So crazy. So this was what their study found, that 66% of websites in the study were publishing duplicate content. So obvious error, but you might be subconsciously doing it. And the good news is that once this is fixed, you can really skyrocket in the rankings. Your site will grow in authority as a whole. So duplicate content is multiple pages that are either similar to or match each other, or it's content that's been pasted from someone else. If you ever had someone involved in content creation, if they were doing that at some point, we've ran into so many clients where that was happening. So the good news is that addressing this duplicate content issue can seriously improve your SEO. So a tool I really like to use, and we use this tool once a day to check almost all of the content we produce, is copy and it's I think it's five or six cents per search so you can run your content through this tool and then anything that hits a percentage match is something you want to rewrite so at Express Writers our goal is zero percent we want to be 100 percent unique original and of course you can weigh this against the content you're producing if it's like a BuzzFeed list of movie quotes you can get away with some duplicate content if it's not for SEO purposes, you can not worry as much about this. Or if you're updating an older piece of content, it's okay to have content that was already published in that piece. So our sixth bad tactic, this one is one of the worst, is buying backlinks. That is such a no-no. This is one of the oldest and most black hat SEO techniques. Buying links is expressly forbidden and penalized by Google nowadays. So you don't even want to go there. Do not play with this at all. So how does Google look at backlinks? Google views each link to your site as a vote of confidence. So if you buy backlinks, <laughs> Google equates that to vote rigging. Terrible, so this is one of the worst in all of our seven tactics to definitely avoid. And in Google's Webmaster Forum, the sentence is underlined in red here. Google says specifically that buying or selling links may be considered part of a link scheme, and it will definitely be, be considered a violation of Google's Webmaster guidelines. So any attempt, any link that is perceived as something that's manipulating your search ranking is a violation in Google's eyes. It's just something they really come down on after link farms and many things that were done back in those old days of SEO where this was really done to a large extent by many website owners. 
So Google has really hit hard and they launched several algorithm updates. Panda was one of them just to enforce the standard. So what is the solution? This is something I talk with a lot of business owners about. I think the solution is in creating backlink worthy content consistently. So that's easier than it is. It's consistency, it's being the best, it's being a resource that people want to link to in short. That's how I would describe it. So if you strive to become a known resource that and a publication, whatever your site, whatever category you're in, but if you start to become an authority that people can know, like, and trust, and want to share with others because of all the amazing things they're learning from you, and they want to link to it, that's how to earn your best backlinks. And this takes a lot of time and commitment. So this kind of poses the question, I've gotten this question so often, can you survive without actually buying or acquiring links. So, you know, going and seeking out links, emailing people, asking for that backlink. Can you survive without doing that at all? Well, I think the answer is yes. And I'll give you a few case studies in the next few minutes as to why. For one, we're an example. So in eight years, we built our site from a brand new site to over 50 DA. And I think we're at a crazy amount of backlinks. I haven't checked it in a while. <laughs> so the quality of content, originality of thought in the blogs we create, and then relevance to our audience, that's always come first instead of seeking out backlinks. And there have been other publications that have done this to even greater success. So one case study I love is Unbounce. Ollie Gardner, back in the early days, he was writing content to grow this brand. And their brand is at, I think, over $7 million in revenue. So almost double what our agency has done. So in the early days, he created this massive guide. He published it as a guest author on Moz. It was 13,000 words. It was a 15 million pixel infographic. And it was called the Noob's Complete Guide to Online Marketing. So it was downloaded over 150,000 times. And it earned thousands of backlinks. That creating that level of content is so much better than seeking out backlinks. It's going to be worth your time, energy, effort to focus on creating something like that instead of seeking backlinks. And another example would be Buffer. Kevin Lee over at Buffer, he's created ultimate style content that has earned hundreds of links per post for Buffer. And a lot of this is original research, either pulled from someone else or sometimes internally. So for example, he created what we learned through 43 million Facebook posts. And that in-depth piece earned 164 organic backlinks all by itself. So I think the answer to should we buy backlinks? Should we seek out backlinks? Do we have to? You don't have to if you're creating amazing content consistently and striving to be known for that. So our seventh bad tactic to wrap up all seven, this is our last one, is forgetting about consumer reviews or even worse, getting fake ones posted and written. So again, kind of obvious, but this is happening in a large amount today. So 70% of consumers they're checking out company and product reviews individually before making an online purchase. That's a huge amount of consumers. That's why it matters. But a study by the Washington Post found that 61% of electronic reviews on Amazon are completely fake. So fake reviews is a big problem online. In this world where everyone is looking for ratings and reviews, it's not good to post fake reviews. And here's why. I don't think I added this as a slide, but a lot of times these platforms have gotten a lot smarter at looking for fake reviews and they are deleting them quickly. So all the effort put into those fake reviews by whatever marketer did that was not worth the time. So instead, we can ask more happy customers to review us on a regular basis. And the best time to do that, and I have told my management this at Express Writers, listen in for those moments where your clients are really excited and tell you this through email, live chat, messenger, 
whatever communication you use, maybe even a phone call. And as soon as you hear that moment where they're just thrilled with whatever you produce for them, that's a great time to ask for a review. So it can be fairly simple if you're just doing that consistently and listening in for those moments. Okay, so to recap, all of the things we talked about, just remember, if we're still practicing these outdated or worse penalization worthy practices, Google and our human audience is not gonna like us very much. So Steve Carroll's face in the movie about Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, that will leave you with an image of what Google thinks and our users think whenever they're encountering these no-nos that we really should be avoiding on a regular basis. And just remember, whatever works for our human user works for Google. So Google is essentially pro-user. And they say this many times throughout their guidelines. If it doesn't serve the user, if it's a manipulation, if it's nothing, if it's if you're creating something that doesn't work for your human audience, Google doesn't like it either. So rule of thumb as we wrap up. And all of our seven tactics to go over these at a bird's eye view in our recap. And you have these in the handout, as Danny mentioned. So definitely grab that and you can refer to it at any time. So our first one was not to create too much content around similar keywords. Remember semantic search. Google is looking for content around one topic that really answers the question. So we don't need to create a ton of content around keywords that are all synonymous. We can take those keywords, bucket them, and put them in one content piece. Number two, don't create then content. Think about comprehensive content, which earns everything, more rankings, more mentions, more shares, and even more backlinks. Number three, don't post content erratically. Really get on a content schedule. I would really challenge you to consider this. I find this missing with many business owners, and what happens is if you're not getting consistent today, you're not gonna see those results tomorrow and in the future. Content, good SEO content is like a domino's effect. The more you do it, the more consistently you do it, the more results you're going to see. And it does take time, so start today if you haven't started yet. Number four, remember that quality always comes first. This is what Google's looking for. This is what our user is looking for. Toss out quantity in favor of quality. And my rule of thumb is to create content that's better than what is in Google's top five for the keyword that I'm writing on. So number five, don't post duplicate content. This is an obvious one, but as we found, 66% of website owners are missing this. Copyscape is a great tool you can use to check the originality of your copy. You may have forgotten that it was pasted from somewhere else, or maybe you duplicated two pages on your site by accident. Copyscape can tell you that, and it will give you a percentage match. Number six was all about not buying backlinks, one of the oldest, worst black hat SEO methods out there. Just avoid it entirely. Google hates that, looks at it as vote rigging. Instead, create backlink worthy content. And our last one, don't forget customer reviews. This matters a lot in a world where 70% of people are looking for these ratings and reviews, sometimes before they buy. And you can build this up easily by looking for those yay moments where clients are really happy with your services. So that is a wrap. Thank you guys so much for sitting in and listening. I was sick today, so hopefully my voice breaks weren't too annoying. <laughs> but I really appreciate you all being here. And I think it's now time for Q&A. So I'll hand it back to Danny. It is indeed time, and great job, Julia. You were quite the trooper uh, going through, even though you're a little under the weather, so we really appreciate you uh, doubly for that. Um, and just a, another quick reminder, uh, if you haven't yet grabbed Julia's um, 
ha uh, handout, just uh, go over to your GoToWebinar panel. I'll uh, look for the little handout section and click on the PDF file there so you can uh, have the resource um, for yourself to re uh, reference again and again. So um, yeah, if you're ready, let's do some Q&A because we've gotten quite a few good questions in. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, one of our attendees wants to know, what is the best way that someone can become an SEO expert? Now, is there anything you would recommend in terms of training or resources? Um, like, how did you become the SEO expert that you have become? Oh, that's a great question. Well, for me, it was trial and error across five years, so I don't recommend it that way. <laughs> that's the painful way. <laughs> well, what is the best way to learn, though, sometimes? You know, failure sometimes is the greatest teacher, so, but yeah. yeah that is so true. Yeah. But I would say, you know, follow people that are sharing ethical, really useful advice in our SEO industry. And those people would be a mix of publications and authors. And I would say, you know, for one, if you're not subscribed to Search Engine Journal, that is a great platform. It's not just me. It's many other experts sharing the best in news, trends, guides in this industry. Besides that, Backlinko is a great resource. Brian's even at Backlinko. I think he publishes a new guide every quarter now. So he's all about quality over quantity. And these new guides are amazing. There are thousands and thousands of words and they're really in-depth resources in SEO. And you can follow my write blog at Express Writers. I write a lot of content that revolves around SEO writing and what we see with our clients, our writers, struggles that they have from including really weird keywords to trends and guides on SEO writing. Excellent. Okay. Question on keywords and keyword usage. Uh, someone wants to know, do you recommend using related keywords in just one piece or would you recommend doing multiple pieces around certain keywords and using internal links sort of like as a pillar cluster approach? That could definitely work. I think it depends on what your goal is for that content piece. If you're looking at rankings, it's always better to get that original content written for the piece itself. But if you're just looking to create a resource, maybe let's say for the people visiting your site, we have pages like that that are kind of built out as a cluster resource with multiple links where to go. So it really depends on your goal. If it's ranking, always add that original content in your piece. Make it comprehensive. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions about um, word count. So one of them was, how do you generally feel about super long uh, posts, like in somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 plus? Uh, do you recommend that for everyone, or do you think that's more of a case where you have to be careful about what uh, niche or industry you're in? Yes, absolutely. I wouldn't say that's for everyone. And again, it comes back to the goals of your content. Are you trying to rank in Google for this piece, or are you trying to give your newsletter list something to read, you know, brand awareness, share a product update. Those pieces shouldn't be long. In fact, too long can really turn people off. And I think in the Backlinko study, what ranked in the top 10 of Google wasn't really over 2,000 words. It was somewhere between 1,900 to 2,000. So all the content we create on the right block to rank for over 20,000 keywords is a mix. So it's not just these 5,000 words guides, we create a 5,000 word guide uh, once every, gosh, once every three months now. So definitely weigh that against your goals. If you're trying to rank in Google for a keyword like how to write SEO content, which is something we would create an ultimate guide for, definitely go longer form. But if you're just going for something where it's not related to a keyword ranking, or it's for your list, your email readers, you don't have to go as long form for sure. Yeah, definitely. Think Always think about like your audience too, because you know, let's say in your, maybe the entertainment industry, you know, they're not looking for really long content versus marketing. You know, obviously in, in our industry, there's a lot of really good writers, so the stuff's gonna be longer. So yeah, it very much depends on, uh, you know, your, your particular area, so. Uh, good points there. Um, another one related to word count. Um, 
So for if someone's writing like 2,000 to 3,000 word piece on a regular schedule, what sort of a realistic um, way to do that, um, you know, in terms of resources? Mm, yes, good question. Well, I think something like that, you know, I would post that maybe not more than once a week. And then in terms of resources, definitely think about a writer and an editor and a designer if you can. And in our agency, we have all of those compartmentalized in our content services. So you could look for an agency that does it all instead of just trying to hire three individual people. But you really want original content written. The meat of the content can take days. So <laughs> I always recommend delegating that if you can, unless you're, you know, you're the author and the thought leader, then you probably shouldn't. But you can definitely delegate and that's how to get less burnout and more quality content produced. A uh, question, uh, if you're not talking about the blog specifically, but just a, a, a website, do you have any recommendations for how often per month say that, you know, you should be publishing content? I think that varies, you know, what you were saying, Danny, your audience, yeah. your industry, and then your goals. Always come back to your goals with content. Yes. Are you trying to be, you know, the resource in the industry that gets thousands of visitors per month? Then you should be creating more quality content than, you know, 90% of your competitors if you can. But if your goal is to, like, let's say you're local, maybe you get more clients just through networking or referrals, then you may not have to build that presence in Google as much as someone who wants to get 100% of their leads through Google would. So um, HubSpot recommended, I think it was 16 times per month to get that huge traffic spike, and I think it's four times more leads. But we at Express Writers, we're down to one blog a week, and that's the quality that we can commit to. And I think it also ties into, if you're emailing this to your list, you don't want to send your list too many emails. So either wrap it all up in one campaign, mm -hmm. and you can send that once a month, or if you're doing one blog a week, you can send that without you know, killing them with too much content in their inbox. So think about how you tie it to email marketing as well. Very good point on that. Um, this is another interesting question. So, you know, there are many cases I've heard about this where, you know, we're marketers, we're not experts in certain industries. Uh, and I had one question about that. So, you know, I have a person who's the marketer for a, a brand that um, does preclinical uh, pre research and they're saying, and they're asking basically, how can you, uh, update content if you're not the expert? Uh, is it okay to sort of update existing content where you're not really able to produce the content yourself? Or what would you recommend in that case? Would it be like going out to find people to help write, you know, sort of people who are experts? What's, what's your recommendation for a case like that? Yes, great question. Well, that comes down to, I think, finding the expert author that you need. So Google's acronym, Expertise, Authoritativeness, Trust. Expertise was the first letter in that acronym. So Google really looks for an author that's an expert in the industry. And this is something we've actually evolved doing in the last uh, three years out of the eight years in our content agency. We find expert writers for different clients. So a medical industry, we get crazy industries, technical industries, we have a bioengineering client, we go find a writer that has spent actual work in that industry, has actually done either a career, they taught at a university on that topic, so they had school knowledge. So you have to really have that knowledge to write with the level of quality that Google is looking for, which is expertise. Okay, I'm just checking through the questions. A lot of good ones here. Um, this is an interesting one. So one of the people is asking about, uh, so basically their old SEO strategy was basically creating a bunch of one keyword pages, which again, it goes back to that whole, you know, this is a really outdated tactic. So uh, what would you recommend in a case like that? Should, uh, should they maybe consolidate content uh, that's related or what would you suggest in a case like that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, first of all, look at the quality of what you have to start with. If it's thin, if it's not comprehensive, if it's like if there's typos, like just the basic quality. If that's missing, then what I would do is 
start doing away with all of those pieces and get on a strategy of new content that's more topically related. So that semantic search friendly topic approach where we're getting one focus keyword and then all the synonymous keywords go inside that comprehensive piece of content. So if the quality is good, then yeah, absolutely, you could take those pieces of content and as long as it's done in a way to where the new pieces read really well and you're achieving that quality, which is our end goal with content, then you can absolutely take existing content and use it in a new piece. But start with the quality of what you have. And if it's just not there, I hate to say it, but it's time to create new content. Okay, good answer. I, I totally agree with that. Okay, uh, another good question. Okay, so this is an on... All right, this is an example. So this person has a real estate website and they're asking, is it safe to add content that's you know not exactly um, relevant to the business? Like for example, if they want to publish something on spring cleaning, would that make sense? Or should they just sort of, uh, when they're coming up with their content ideas, should they really try to um, stay close to their core keyword focus? Or is it okay to sometimes go off topic and you know, try to expand your keyword universe, even if it's not totally relevant uh, to, to your, you know, to your uh, brand or business? Oh, I love that question. That is such a great question. Well, I teach this in my content strategy course and a lot of students, they love this concept. But what I teach basically is think of your topic area as a circle. The middle of that circle is your expertise. So real estate, that's what you're good at. That's what you know. That's what your website is on. That's your core, but to create content that's going to be read, loved, shared, consumed by your actual audience, you wanna branch out to what they're interested in. So yeah, spring cleaning is a great blog topic. You don't just wanna write on your products, your services, avoid that in useful content, just avoid that completely if you can and create worthwhile, valuable content that's interesting, engaging, and even, you know, you could provide some um, educational, informative content that is fun to read, so creative. So definitely branch out beyond that core into what your audience wants to hear about. So the idea of spring cleaning is a great idea, and I would just research a keyword for that, especially if you're in a location, look for a location keyword, and then you could add like a number of steps to that headline. Excellent, okay, uh, another question. Do you have any uh, sort of tactics or tips for product descriptions? Because a lot of the stuff we've talked about is really sort of the longer form content, but uh, do you have any recommendations when it comes to like sort of the e-commerce side of things with, um, you know, making your content more unique so it's not having that problem that you're talking about with duplicate content? Yes, yeah, so that's where you definitely don't want to go long form with product descriptions. It's very rare that long form works there. So what you want to think about is definitely 100% original content. If you're not sure, you know, have someone run some of your content through Copyscape and just get an idea of how much duplicacy is there. And <clears throat> a fresh rewrite of product descriptions can be amazing for SEO. We had a client that did that and I think they went up by several thousand in traffic numbers just through the Google rankings they got from that fresh content. And something else you really want to consider with e-commerce product descriptions besides, you know, and you don't need many words, 300 words can really hit the mark for a good product description. So think about your keywords, definitely use them in the copy and meta descriptions matter enormously. I mean, to all content, but to product descriptions as well, especially because that can, original meta description, original meta title for that piece of content, Google will grab that and see that as new content almost right away for a product description. Right, absolutely. Okay, another good question here. Uh, Q and A content. Um, do you think it's a good, uh, do you think question and answer format is good? Uh, this is particularly someone asking uh, for like a medical uh, website. Uh, do you think this is good, a good way to engage uh, new or potential patients? Um, and I'll just add that I think 
you know, myself, if I'm going to answer, you know, Q&A sort of content is really hot right now, especially with mm -hmm. featured snippets. So, um, yeah, definitely be here, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on this, Julia. <coughs> yes, well, <clears throat> excuse me, what you just said about the featured snippets, like question and answer content, especially for also voice search. You know, if someone's asking yeah. Alexa, you know, what is content marketing? That's a question. You can answer that with, I think it's 30 to 40 word snippets that Alexa will pull from Google and read back to you. So we've been doing more of that in our own content, Q&A style. And <clears throat> Again, like that, it all comes down to the quality. So have an expert author create it who knows the medical industry. You know, don't just have anyone write that. And that way, your content piece will be positioned as, you know, what Alexa would potentially read back to someone asking that question. But yes, that's that's a really, really great format these days to create content in. And you can even post that as a blog. And you can go long form with that. So you can create a string of, you know, 20 questions to answer and then write those 20 short snippet answers and that's one piece of content where you've addressed 20 questions in the medical industry and you can name it more specifically with the topic. Absolutely. Uh, great answer. Uh, we'll do just two more and we'll do tools now. Let's turn to tools. So someone wants to know, what is your favorite keyword research tool? Oh, I love I love questions about tools because I am such a SEO tool nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yes. My favorite these days are um, there are two different tools. I love Mangles. Um, they produce a tool called Keyword Finder, and the UX of this tool is just amazing. At a glance, you can see this dashboard kind of looks like a little bit of like a car dashboard. You have like a speedometer on the right. You're seeing the rating of that keyword. You're seeing what the keyword currently ranks for in the top 10 positions in SERPs and you're, you don't have to click through anything. So at a glance, you're seeing all the most valuable information about that keyword that you need in Mangles Keyword Finder and that's just mangles.com. You can find their tools there. And the second one I really love, and we use this probably more for our clients and our big agency accounts because of the accuracy, is SEMrush. So they have some of the most accurate keyword data that I've found, and other good tools would be AREFs, Moz. Those are a couple more really good tools. I'm also a big fan of just Google's tool, uh, the related searches, and autocomplete too. I think those are also really... Yeah. Really good, and you know they're free too, so can't beat them. And it's, you're getting the data straight from Google, so always, you know, people also ask all those all those on SERP features. You know, use them because they're, yes. they're great as well. For once uh, you have once you have that focus keyword, yeah, that's definitely your next step to take it into yeah. Google. Look at the autocomplete. Look at the synonymous yeah. at the bottom. Absolutely. And then this was actually my question because I was very curious about this. So do you have a favorite tool for content creation? Um, can be anything, can be optimizing, it could be like spelling grammar. I know we already talked about Copyscape, but I was wondering if you have like another sort of like go-to tool that you use every time you're uh, sort of creating content. Yes. Well, uh, can, do I have to do one? Can I do two? No. Use okay. Do as many as you like. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, yeah, that's that, I love that question. Well, I'm pretty old school, so I love Microsoft Word for just, like, drafting out my thoughts. But um, if I have a really comprehensive piece of content, like an ultimate guide or even a book, which I'm creating my third one these days, mm. I love Scrivener. It is amazing because, mostly because of the table of contents that you can build on the left-hand side, and you can just click one time and go straight to whatever subheader, whatever subsection, or if you're writing a book, whatever chapter. And then you can move it around also with just a click and a drag if you don't like where that section is. Mm -hmm. So Scrivener is a long form content creators heaven <laughs> with organization. Definitely love awesome. that. Very cool. All right. 
Um, yeah, I think that's good for questions for now. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be doing a, a wrap-up post that we'll publish on Monday on Search Engine Journal, and Julia uh, will we'll, uh, send all, all the questions we didn't get to to her so she can answer them for you. Um, yeah, and thanks, Julia. That was a really great uh, presentation. Thanks for doing all the Q&A. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate yes. the opportunity. This was great. This was a lot of fun. It was. Uh, okay, so just a quick closing point. Um, let's see. So um, before you head off, um, we're about to end the, the webinar, uh, but we're going to ask you to take a quick uh, short survey right after uh, the webinar is over. I uh, would really appreciate it if you could uh, take the survey. It helps us uh, improve our future webinars for you, um, gives, lets us basically know, you know what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, so any feedback you can give us would be really much appreciated. Uh, I also wanted to let you know about our next webinar that's coming up on April 24th. I'm really looking forward to this one, too. Uh, we're going to have How to Take Your Website Beyond Fast, and that's going to be presented by Jono Alderson of Yoast. So uh, that's definitely one you won't want to miss, uh, and you can already start registering now for that on our SEJ webinar page. So I uh, hope to see you at that one as well. Uh, and that's it for us uh, for this SEJ Think Tank webinar. So thank you guys again so very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we hope to see you, uh, a, another SEJ webinar soon. And if you could please just take that survey really quick, we would appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much.